Mina san, konbanwa. Yeah, see, there are a few here that served in Japan. <laughs> Brown Shoro, where are you? Stand up. See, this is Elder Brown. Now, can you imagine what he looked like in Japan on a bus? <laughs> he served for a time, his companion, uh, Elder Brown and Elder Moss. Elder Moss was, uh, came back and was on the University of Utah football team, so they were similar similarly sized, and they were powerful missionaries, I'll tell you. Uh, it's a thrill for me to be here with you, uh, brothers and sisters. And uh, it, I was impressed as I walked in and as I, I saw the, the list of uh, those who are, who are here uh, and their, their ranks, uh, it's it's really kind of uh, it's just very impressive, uh, I think, uh, and, and would recognize uh, Elder and Sister Carlson and Elder and Sister Oaks, Elder and Sister T Sitati. Uh, I I believe I saw uh, Elder Wood uh, also. There we go. I I knew that I did as we walked in. Elder and Sister Wood, and. Uh, ranks there and then the, the major generals that are here and everyone else. Uh, more brass in here than what? Than a, a, a reloader's workbench, let's say that. There's a lot of brass here. Uh, and uh, it's very, very impressive. Uh, I am, am very pleased to have the assignment, and it's been one that I've had for some time now, uh, that uh, Brother Clausen was so kind uh, to extend. Um, we have here ch uh, chaplains from all branches of the military. Uh, we have chaplains for health care facilities, uh, border patrol, prisons, colleges and universities, civil air patrol law enforcement as well. I met a chaplain who's serving up in Vancouver, Canada, uh, Elder Mortensen. We were, we were, we grew up in the same ward together, uh, in the deacons quorum together. Hadn't seen him since I w was in sixth grade, I don't think. Uh, it's really quite humbling to sense the magnitude of your responsibility and the profound influence that you have on the hearts and minds of Heavenly Father's children who are in places where they need, they have uh, significant needs. Now, just yesterday, uh, General Burton uh, uh, visited the presiding bishopric, and uh, he's from Camp Williams. I think most of you know it's south of here near Point of the Mountain. But he came to the bishopric to express the gratitude to the church and the first presidency uh, that they have for, uh, for the provision that we made of providing a non-denominational non chapel at Camp Williams. And it caused me to remember three years ago when he and a, and a small group, uh, his contingency came to our office to request uh, assistance in helping construct this interfaith uh, chapel and uh, at Camp Williams. And I really won't ever forget the feelings that I had that day as they described to the bishopric how acute the needs are for the healing influence of the Lord's love in the lives of so many uh, who are suffering uh, the effects of war, long deployments, uh, being away from home, personal trials, uh, some of these challenges that come uh, in uh, uniquely uh, in military service. And he described the need that they had for a non-denominational facility uh, where there could be the healing balm that comes as you provide a healing balm as chaplains. And at that time, the presiding bishopric felt firsthand, uh, in a very profound way, the importance of the roles that you have uh, in the lives of those whom you serve and minister. And so 
that would be the beginning for me, an extension of uh, what happened yesterday uh, and an expression of uh, the deepest gratitude from the bottom of the hearts of the Bishop Brick and the First Presidency who were so very much involved in the decision to, to underwrite and construct uh, this chapel out in Camp Williams. Now you have a rich history uh, and over many, many years from the very beginning, I, I'm sure that uh, as I recite the history, you already know it, but it was revealing to me. Uh, Army chaplains first reported to George Washington's army in 1775, at which time they didn't have specific duties, but general duties like perform divine service, pray with wounded, bury the dead. They were given $20 a month and asked to do anything else uh, that was requested by their individual commanders. Today, many of those things that were described then would be uh, part of your job description today. Uh, in addition to uh, advising unit commanders on the spiritual state of the forces, serving as religious advisors to service members of all faiths, the issues that you work on are deep, complex, and, and very needful. Uh, suicide prevention, PS, uh, PTSD uh, intervention, and, and uh, therapy. And some of the issues that uniquely affect families with these long uh, 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 terms of, uh, of separation. Now, I'm interest, I was also interested to learn, and this, is, this was an education for me, qualifications today for a, a, a chaplain. And, and this is what we quote, potential military chaplains must meet high standards for education and experience, a graduate degree in theology, two years of professional experience, endorsed as a qualified leader by their denomination, pass a physical exam and security check. And uh, although they may be, they're non-combatants, they also undergo military training, basic training, attend chaplain basic officer leadership course, uh, non-combatant common core skills, army writing, uh, also trained in counseling and crisis intervention. Very interesting to me, and, and as, the, as the brethren and the first presidency have have become aware and understand these issues that uh, you know the great things that have happened at BYU to address uh, the issues that uh, come with respect to qualifications. Yes. Now, this is what uh, General uh, Burton brought uh, to us yesterday. This is a 75 millimeter uh, shell casing. And you can imagine, I was fascinated by this as he gave it to me. Uh, and, and you can imagine the damage that, uh, that this could do, uh, something of this size. We haven't always had this kind of uh, uh, equipment to defend ourselves over, over all the years, but, uh, and then we think of what we have today, and, and there's been dramatic changes and advancements over the years in weaponry. Uh, I want to take you back to a time, to, to have you think about uh, a time when we had uh, a military battle. Uh, I'm sure it's familiar to all of you. It took place in 1025 BC in the Middle East. At that time, the Philippines, the, or the Philistines, <laughs> not the Philippines, I don't know what was going on there then, uh, probably some war there as well, but. In Palestine, the Philistines were at war with Israel, and this is when a large giant of a man, Goliath, taunted the Israelites, challenging them to send out someone to fight him. And the stakes were very high. He said, whichever side lost would become slaves of the victor. High stakes. And when Saul and the Israelites heard the words, uh, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And you know the story, David, who was the youngest son of Jesse, served, served as a sheep herder for his father. And when he heard the taunts of Goliath, he said to Saul, thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. 
And then Saul responded, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight him, for thou art but a youth. And I don't know how David, I, as great a, a uh, aim he was with a slingshot, he must have been a salesman. I don't know how he ever convinced his father to say yes, but Saul, he did convince him, and Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. It must have had something to do with faith. And so, <clears throat> Goliath had a brass helmet, a coat of mail, brass armor on his legs and between his shoulders, a spear with a head that weighed 600 shekels of iron, and we know that to be about 15 pounds. So that's a heavy spear that he's carrying. And this doesn't seem like this was fair to me, but we're told that he, he even had a shield bearer who advanced in front of him. And so he's huge. Uh, according to the Old Testament, he was six cubits and a span. Today, that is estimated to be about nine and a half feet. Okay, now we think of Mark Eaton, and he was a pretty big man. Okay, and Mark Eaton was seven and a half feet. And so imagine, you know, the difference between five and a half feet and seven and a half feet, and now seven and a half feet to nine and a half feet. Think of the size uh, of Goliath. David approached Goliath as a young teenage boy, carrying only a staff, five smooth stones he gathered from a nearby brook, a sling and a shepherd's bag. And when Goliath saw who Israel had sent, he taunted David. And with boldness and faith, David replied as follows. I can see some of our missionaries doing this. Some of the, the, the courage that missionaries have when you see them out in the field. But he said, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. This day will the Lord deliver me into mine hand, that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. And then... We have this, and all this assembly, assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And so David withdrew the first stone from his shepherd's bag. I don't think he was worrying about the size, the power, the reputation, or the shininess of the armor, because David knew that he was clothed with the armor of God. He aimed his sling squarely at Goliath's unprotected forehead, did not flinch as he let a stone fly, and Goliath fell dead. Then the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the, palace, the Philistines until the battle was won. Now, many of you here may have had or may have yet a tour of duty uh, not unlike David's. You may feel the taunting of the enemy and see battle up close and personal. You've seen and you've probably worn combat gear required of today's military who serve in dangerous combat zones. <clears throat> Today we see Kevlar helmets designed to protect the head, deflect shell fragments, other destructive material, Combat boots that protect your feet, protective vests to safeguard the torso, eye protection uh, like ballistics, uh, goggles or sunglasses, ear protection. No seasoned military commander would ever dream of sending his men or women into the battle without these protections along with any other armor uh, which might be designed to protect his troops. So now let's shift our thinking a little bit to a battle that's taking place that all of us, in which all of us are engaged. The battle for the eternal souls of the people over whom you minister and have stewardship. And we also have to remember that it is for ours as well. Uh, not just those over whom you minister, but because you put yourself in harm's way and many of the same things 
that, that those over whom you minister are subject to, you as well are subject to those. And we know well how Paul described this. He said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of, of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then he goes on to describe the armor of God to combat what he calls the rulers of darkness. He says that we need to put on the whole armor of God, and he described this loins girt about with truth, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation. When, uh, we talked about this even in our mission a little bit, didn't we, Elder Brown? And we used to say, uh, feet shod in, preach my gospel. Although in the scriptures it says your feet shod in the preparation of the gospel, but preach my gospel does prepare them. Uh, this is the armor that we have. And then above all, the shield of faith and <clears throat> the sword of the spirit. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Now, Paul counseled us to put on the whole armor of God with, so that we would have uh, complete protection. Now, the Lord's armor, Goliath was completely armored up, wasn't he? But the Lord's armor, is a, it's a virtual armor. And this is the armor that David was wearing, and it wasn't the armor that Goliath was wearing. And so every day we put on this uh, armor of God. We, we stand in front of the mirror, and, and, and I often think as I stand in front of the mirror, I have, a, I have a, a, a sign in my bathroom that I received as I ended my mission from Japan, my mission present, uh, Arthur Nishimoto, who maybe some of you know, who is a military man himself, gambate, which means I'm going to hang in there. And I sometimes even think as I'm putting my tie on, I'm putting on my armor to go out into the world. Uh, and if we fail to put our armor on, then we find ourselves defenseless. Now, of all the pieces that uh, Paul describes uh, as the armor of God, uh, there's one that is, uh, is vitally important, uh, and it's the sword of what? The sword of the Spirit. And I find it interesting to think that the sword is really as we think about the, the weapon that that uh, was described by Paul, the, the armor that was described by Paul, most of that really is, is protection, really for defense, but the sword of the spirit really is the, the weapon that is the offensive weapon. Uh, and I'd like you to think about this. It is what allows, uh, allows a, the military to advance, uh, maybe in some cases recapture lost ground. And so as you think about your role as chaplains, think about the sword of the spirit and how important the spirit is. Uh, you'll want to make certain that you and those with whom you're working and counseling uh, have with them the sword of the spirit. Now, President uh, Harold B. Lee said the following, you cannot lift another soul until you are standing on higher ground. You cannot light a fire in another soul unless it is burning your own soul, burning in your own soul. It is therefore essential for each of you to be able to uh, wield your own sword before you can obtain and help others uh, do the same. So I'd like to just describe a few things that, that I observe that I think are important elements for you to have the sword of the spirit, for you to have the weapon that's going to allow you uh, an offense. Number one is, you'll, we've heard these time and time again, but they're relevant time and time again. Study the scriptures. You know, Paul also defines the sword of the Spirit as the Word of God, and so there's no better way to receive the Word of God than by studying what the Lord has said. Um, the Lord suggests that 
by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things. And it is through the, the study of scriptures that you capture the spirit, you, you enable yourself with the sword of the spirit. Number two would be prayer. This is our direct connection to our Heavenly Father through his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, in in uh, Second Nephi, we read, Ye must pray always and not faint, that ye must not perform anything unto the Lord, save in the first place ye shall pray unto the Father in the name of Christ, that he will consecrate thy performance unto thee, and that thy performance may be for the welfare of thy soul. And so, as simple as it is, we find numerous places where the scriptures teach us the importance of prayer. Isn't that a beautiful image? And there's probably no place where man's relationship with the divine becomes clearer than moments of crisis like this. <clears throat> Humility. The Lord said, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which shall come upon you and which shall dwell in your heart. And so if we want to be able to receive the promptings of the Spirit, we need to cultivate a spirit of humility and a heart that is receptive to feeling his words. Now, here's an example of how important it is to be able to feel the word. It's when Nephi's brothers, Laman and them, you'll complain that the Lord did not show them the same things that Nephi saw. They were jealous. It was an element of pride. And Nephi said, you're swift to do iniquity, but slow to remember the Lord your God. You've seen an angel. He spake unto you. You've heard his voice from time to time, and he hath spoken unto you in a still, small voice, but you were past feeling that you could not feel his words. So if we want to feel the words of the Lord in our minds and in our hearts, we must cultivate this spirit of humility that will keep our hearts soft. And the words, uh, interestingly, are that they harden their hearts, which is an element of pride that allows them, because their hearts were so hard, they couldn't feel. And so our hearts need to be soft in order to be respect, uh, receptive to the spirit, which is the weapon that's going to allow us to advance uh, forward. Uh, the Lord's law of health uh, would be another area that I think would be important. He's promised that if we take care of ourselves physically, that we receive health in our navel, marrow, and our bones. We'll find wisdom and great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures. We'll run and not be weary, walk and not faint. And this is important to wield the sword, even the sword of the spirit, is to be physically uh, fit and mindful of our physical health, the Lord's law of health. So many of the problems that you're dealing with come because there's a, a physical addiction that is taking place that is robbing someone of their agency. They no longer have the ability to act. They are acted upon. And so this measure of physical fitness is uh, strong. The last one that I would offer to you is let, vernish, let virtue garnish thy thoughts. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. Touch no unclean thing. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. We need to be clean and virtuous as the Lord has commanded. Virtue is one of the, uh, what do you call it in young women's, one of the values, thank you. I should know that. <laughs> Virtue is one of the values for the young women. It's something that we don't think about enough as men, and we should. Uh, and the promise is a beautiful promise that comes to us in section 121 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Then shall your confidence wax strong in the presence of God, and the Holy Ghost shall be thy constant companion, 
and thy scepter an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth. <clears throat> How do you, in the world, in, in the polluted water that you have to wade in, maintain your virtue and virtuous thoughts? Well, we have to do it. We have to find a way to do it. Okay, you have to teach it, and you have to do it yourselves. And uh, we remember the simple, uh, the simple solution that was, was offered by uh, President Packer many years ago about, uh, about pushing, not letting something come into the stage of your mind without pushing it out with something else. And he suggested to him, there's a lot of things that you can do to do this. Uh, missionaries uh, need to constantly make certain that they keep their, their minds clean and their thoughts virtuous. And all of us should think of ways to do this. You know, one of the things that I have thought of over the years is, is find good things to memorize. Memorize them, and if thoughts ever come that shouldn't be there, move to those good things that you memorized and let those uh, occupy your mind rather than things that you shouldn't. I'll give you an example. This is a little bit strange, but this is one example. It, it also was combined with a, st a reading once that I was doing in the Old Testament, and I get to the genealogies, and I thought, these genealogies have no relevance to me. W why are they even there? And I, and I kind of chastised myself and said, they must be there for a reason. So I made it a study, and then I even went so far as to make it one of these things that I would put in my mind if I, I had thoughts that, that I didn't want there. Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Malalil, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Shamar, Faxed, Salah, Eger, e Eber, Peleg, Ru, Surg, Nahor, Terah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Ephraim, Manasseh. How's that? <laughs> 25 generations in the Old Testament. It became a study for me that was absolutely revealing. One of the lectures on faith is the genealogy that we find there, section 107. It's everywhere, but it's in my mind now as well. And there are many other lists. Lisa says, don't do them all. They'll think you're really strange uh, with all of these things that you've memorized. But if you can teach and if you can practice a way to keep your minds virtuous and let your thoughts be virtuous, uh, you're, you're winning the battle. Uh, you're winning a battle against the adversary. And then, as you master, you can teach others how to master. Okay, well, if we study the scriptures and we pray regularly, we develop humility, and we have this health code, uh, we, we have virtue garnish our thoughts, then the Holy Ghost can begin to be our constant companion. Now, let me just uh, finish with a beautiful story. Because of what you do, it's such an impressive thing that you do. You're serving a group of noble servants, and you never know how powerful your influence can be upon them. You really can become heroes, and you are. You can help, you can save, you can be heroes. Now, this is a story that goes back to uh, 1943. World War II. It's on the vessel Dorchester. It was crowded to capacity. 902 servicemen, merchant seamen, civil workers were on this vessel. And it was moving across the icy waters of Newfoundland towards an American base in Greenland, escorted by some Coast Guard cutters. The ship's captain, Hans Danielson, was concerned and very cautious Earlier, one of the escort vessels had detected a submarine with its sonar. And so he knew he was in dangerous waters even before he got that information. German U-boats had been and were constantly prowling these vital sea lines, and many ships had already been blasted and sunk. They were 150 miles from destination. The captain ordered all of the men to sleep in their clothing and to keep their life jackets on even as, even as they slept. Many of the soldiers uh, said they, they couldn't sleep in the, the hold, the deep hold in the ship because it was too hot, and others thought that life jackets were too uncomfortable. 
February 3rd, 1943, 12.55 a.m., a periscope broke the chilly waters of the Atlantic Ocean and through the crosshairs, an officer aboard the German submarine U-223 spotted the Dorchester. It approached the convoy on the surface and after identifying and targeting the ship, he gave orders to fire the torpedoes. Three were fired. One struck the starboard side amidship far below the waterline, and Captain Danielson alerted then that the Dorchester was taking water rapidly and sinking. He gave the order to abandon ship, and in less than 20 minutes, uh, the ship slipped beneath uh, the Atlantic's icy waters. Now this hit, as soon as it hit, it knocked out power and radio contact with the three escort ships. One of those ships, the CGC Comanche, saw the flash of the explosion. It responded immediately and rescued 97 survivors. Another escort ship circled the Dorchester, rescuing another 132 survivors. The third cutter, the Tampa, continued on escorting the remaining two ships. So, as you can imagine, aboard the Dorchester, panic and chaos set in. The blast killed scores of men. Many more were seriously wounded. Others stunned were groping in the darkness. Those sleeping without clothing rushed topside to be met with the icy Arctic air and the knowledge for so many that death was there. Uh, men jumped into lifeboats. Some of the lifeboats were overcrowded to a point of capsizing. Others uh, that were tossed were drifted away before they were boarded. And so through the pandemonium, according to those present, four chaplains brought hope uh, in the midst of this despair and light, in the midst of darkness. These are their images. George Fox, Alexander Good, Jewish, George Fox, Methodist, John Washington, Roman Catholic, and Clark Poling, Dutch Reformed. Quickly and quietly, these four chaplains spread, ab spread out among the soldiers. They tried to calm the frightened, tend the wounded, and guide the disoriented towards safety. And the witnesses of that night remember hearing the four men offer prayers for the dying and encouraging those who live. One witness found himself floating in oiled, smeared water surrounded by dead bodies and debris. I could hear men crying, pleading, praying, he recalls. I could also hear the chaplains preaching courage. Their voices were the only thing that kept me going. Another sailor, Officer Mahoney, tried to re-enter his cabin, but Rabbi Good stopped him. Mahoney was concerned about the air, the Arctic air, and he said, I've forgotten my gloves, and Good responded, never mind, I have two pairs. He gave one to the petty officer. In retrospect, Mahoney realized that Good really didn't have two pairs of gloves, but he just wanted to help, and he wasn't going to leave the Dorchester. And so by this time, most were topside, and the chaplains opened a storage locker and began distributing life jackets. When there were no more in the storage room, they gave theirs to four frightened young men. And this is what John Ladd, one of those men, said, it was the finest thing I have seen or hoped to see this side of heaven. <clears throat> As the ship went down, the survivors in nearby rafts could see the four chaplains, arms linked and braced against the slanting deck. Their voices could be heard offering prayers. So of the 902 men, 672 died that night. There were 230 survivors. And the four chaplains became heroes. Uh, they all died that night. They have become an enduring example of extraordinary faith, courage, and selflessness. They, the Distinguished uh, Service Cross and Purple Heart were awarded posthumously to them in December of 1944 to their next of kin. Now, 
a touching story, and many, many thoughts go through our minds, but a thought of President Monson can't uh, escape our minds as we hear these stories. Uh, President Monson himself, a former, former Navy man, he's invited all of us to help, to reach out, to rescue. And your duty, like these four chaplains that were aboard the Dorchester, is to rescue your troops. And you rescue them from doubt and despair and discouragement and isolation. Uh, the tools that are the tools of the adversary. Interestingly, President Monson, uh, yesterday, in the general conference training that he offered for general authorities and auxiliary presidencies, stood and said, it's been too long since I have talked about the rescue. And he taught again what it means to rescue and how important it is. And so my prayer, brothers and sisters, is for all of you to armor up, to put on the whole armor of God, to carry the sword of the Spirit with you in this world that is so difficult to find yourself letting virtue garnish your thoughts unceasingly and to be a catalyst to those, all those whom you serve, uh, to do the same. I bear my testimony that this is the plan. This is our Heavenly Father's will. His will, it is so plain and precious and sweet. His will is for us to return to him. And it is the enabling power of the atonement of Jesus Christ that allows us, that allows our loving Heavenly Father's will to be met. Ordinances and priesthood keys facilitate the return to a loving Heavenly Father. And so I bear my witness of those things, of a loving Heavenly Father, of his Son, Jesus Christ, and of his role as our Savior and Redeemer, of living prophets who facilitate this with the keys that they possess. And I offer that testimony and witness to you who are involved in such an amazing and good work. And I do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.